finished the last part of this lecture talking about the replication forks that emanate from origins of replication uh, on chromosomes. And now it's time to address what types of chemical reactions are occurring at the replication fork in, in the synthesis of new DNA strands upon template strands of the, original, of the original double helical molecule. So let's look at the basic chemical reaction of DNA synthesis, which, which consists of adding nucleotides to a growing single strand of DNA that is being built up in a complementary fashion to the strand of DNA, which is the template strand, the parental strand. This would be the, one of the daughter strands then. So what we have here are ribose sugars of nucleotides with nitrogenous bases attached to them and phosphates, of course, attached at, at the five prime carbon. And here is an incoming nucleotide, which will be joined to this growing chain. We're growing this chain top to bottom in this schematic diagram. And this is a nucleotide triphosphate. This particular nucleotide triphosphate is deoxynucleotide, uh, di di rather dioxythymidine triphosphate because it, it, contains, it contains a thymine nitrogenous base. So generically speaking, we talk about the precursors to DNA synthesis as being DNTPs, where N stands for A, T, G, or C. D for deoxy because we've talked about um, in the, the nucleotides that are used as building blocks for DNA do not contain a, 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 a hydroxyl group out there, two prime carbon. There is simply a hydrogen there, not hy a hydroxyl group. So there's a hydrogen here, not a hydroxyl group. So they're deoxy at the two prime carbon position. They have a hydroxyl group on the three prime carbon. This would be the three prime carbon. This would be the three prime carbon here. Here's another one, three prime carbon. They have uh, hydroxyl groups there, but not on the two prime carbon. So it, here we have, <laughs> excuse me, here we have an incoming deoxythymine thymidine triphosphate, ribose sugar, three phosphates, and a, a T nitrogenous base. And what do we know about um, a, a, a nucleotide triphosphates? We know that, for example, ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell, can be hydrolyzed to ADP plus PI and thereby release energy because of these high energy phosphate bonds. Well, that is true also for incoming nucleotides in DNA synthesis. Um, the, if we cleave off two inorganic phosphates and attach the three prime oxygen of the last added nucleotide to the, what we call the alpha phosphate of the incoming uh, nucleotide triphosphate. Here we have the alpha phosphate, the beta phosphate, and the gamma phosphate. If the beta and gamma phosphates are released and there is a nucleophilic attack of this oxygen on the three prime hydroxyl group of the previous added nucleotide on the alpha phosphate, we now have joined that oxygen to the phosphate of the incoming nucleotide. We release two PIs, two inorganic phosphates, that is the beta and gamma phosphates, and the alpha, what was the alpha phosphate of the incoming nucleotide is now joined to covalently to the previously added nucleotide at the three prime O. And over here we're not showing the O linkages, we're not showing the O linkages here, but these are diester linkages. There are actually oxygens between the phosphorus atoms and the, the ribose sugars. So we're not drawing them, but I'm just drawing them in there. And that would be true here as well. There would be oxygens and oxygen. So that is the basic chemical reaction that joins a nucleotide to a growing DNA uh, chain being built up again, complementary to the template strand. And of course, we need enzymes to do that. And uh, the main enzyme for the for bacteria, for E. coli, is DNA polymerase 3 that is, a, a, that is ca catalyzing this chemical reaction, catalyzing this chemical attack, this nucleophilic attack of this oxygen on the alpha phosphate. <clears throat> so what about the enzymes that 
conduct DNA synthesis. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this in historical contexts and um, talk about some of the enzymology. And uh, the enzymology, historically speaking, a lot of the enzymology of DNA replication was worked out in the laboratory of Arthur Kornberg at Stanford. And Kornberg and his co-workers uh, isolated extracts from E. coli, the, the human gut bacterium, and they would isolate extracts, and they would fractionate those extracts. And the idea was to isolate, the goal was to isolate enzymes from the bacterium that could polymerize DNA in vitro, that is in a test tube. So they, they sought to identify the enzymes responsible for DNA synthesis by isolating biochemically from extracts of E. coli different enzymes that would cap be capable of polymerizing DNA in vitro, that is polymerizing nucleotides into DNA. And so they would use labeled nucleotide triphosphates. So they would have, um, say here, here's a nucleotide, here's a nitrogenous base, let's say it happens to be A. It's the first carbon, second carbon, third carbon has an OH on it, fourth carbon, fifth carbon, and then O, P, O, P, O, P. And they could radioactively label these P's with radioactive phosphorus, P32, and look for the incorporation of radioactivity that was present in small molecules, namely the di uh, deoxynucleotide triphosphates. They would look for the incorporation, incorporation of radioactivity into large molecules. And the large molecules were DNA strands. They were the polymers. So they looked for the incorporation of monomers into polymers that were catalyzed by particular enzymes. And they wanted to characterize those enzymes. And Kornberg and his co-workers found several interesting things in the enzymes that they isolated that were capable of polymerizing DNA. One of the first properties they noted was that these enzymes could only synthesize DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, not 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Now you know what we mean by the 3' prime to 5'. Prime. That refers to the polarity of the sugar phosphate backbones uh, on, on double helical DNA. So in the synthesis of a new strand of DNA, the direction of synthesis could only proceed in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And that you should, you should realize that that's what we've drawn here. We're synthesizing from the five prime to the three prime direction. And in so doing, there will always be on the last added nucleotide, a free hydroxyl group attached to the three prime carbon. And that's why um, that is the three prime end. And likewise, up here we have a five prime end of the molecule. So we're synthesizing five prime to three prime, not in the reverse direction. So that is our first property that we have there. We have five prime to three prime synthesis. So we're looking at the properties of uh, DNA polymerases that were being characterized by, by Kornberg's lab. So DNA polymerase is an enzyme that can synthesize DNA. Second of all, the um, the polymerases exhibited a, a requirement for a primed template. And what do we mean by that? Well, when Kornberg provided his enzymes that were capable of synthesizing DNA with single-stranded DNA template, you would think that, well, provided deoxynucleotide triphosphates, that an enzyme capable of synthesizing DNA would simply add nucleotides to this growing chain and build up a new daughter strand, a new uh, strand of DNA complementary to the template strand. This would be the template strand. That would be the template. 
but in fact that was not true so um, that did not work if, if he just had single-stranded DNA on the other hand if he provided his enzymes with a primed template in which a short stretch of double-stranded DNA existed this is the template strand now and he will call this the primer which is a short stretch of DNA complementary to the template which primes the template for synthesis then given that from the end of the three prime end of the of the primer three prime to five prime down here from the five prime end um, from the three prime end rather of the primer then new synthesis of DNA would occur so given a primed template then DNA polymerase is capable of synthesizing uh, a new strand of DNA incorporating nucleotides into the growing strand so we need a primed template for uh, the DNA polymerases to work so so far then we have two things we have one five prime to three prime synthesis and two we need have, need to have a primed template and the template will the template is always red the template is red in the three prime to five prime direction given that synthesis always occurs in the five prime to three prime direction that means the template is is being copied being read in the three prime to five prime direction and another feature of the polymerases that uh, Kornberg and colleagues characterized is that they exhibited a phenomenon um, or a characteristic called processivity they were processive and what that means is that DNA polymerization is exhibits processivity is that the the enzymes remain associated with the template for many rounds of nucleotide addition so that if this is a template and then we're synthesizing new DNA on that template let's say here is our primer right here five prime three prime three prime five prime we're synthesizing new DNA in this direction the enzyme that's catalyzing this reaction remains on associated with the template and adds new substrates to the growing strand progressively synthesizing new DNA as it goes along it remains associated as opposed to coming off and coming back on so processive means that it remains associated with the template as it uh, catalyzes the addition of new nucleotides into the into the chain um, some other features of DNA polymerases in terms of their enzymatic activities so if we look now at the enzymatic activities of DNA polymerases one of course we know that we have five prime to three prime polymerase activity this is the enzymatic activity that adds nucleotides to the growing chain in the fashion that we've shown you already um, and that is the, the polymerase the polymerase activity of dna polymerases but they also have two other enzymatic um, capabilities another one is that they have um, three prime to five prime exonuclease activity and a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity means that what this is is it depolymerizes DNA uh, it's a depolymer ace if you will it, in other words it removes nucleotides in the three prime to five prime direction now can you, if you imagine that a polymerase is synthesizing DNA in the 
five prime to three prime direction in this direction, why would it want to chop off nucleotides, remove nucleotides going in the three prime to five prime direction? And you can immediately see that if a mistake is made, that is exactly what a polymerase would want to do. It would want to back up and chew off any um, mistaken nucleotides containing the wrong nitrogenous base, for example, that had been added if it had made a mistake and then re-engage its polymerase, five prime to three prime polymerase activity to insert new nucleotides then in the, in the correct direction once uh, defective nucleotides or the wrong nucleotides had been removed. So what this activity, <coughs> excuse me, constitutes is a proofreading activity. So polymerases contain an enzymatic activity that allows them to proofread and correct mistakes as if they are made during DNA synthesis. Now we'll talk about other DNA repair enzymes that can repair mistakes that are not corrected by polymerase, but polymerase does have its own um, repair mechanisms that we call proofreading, and that is the ability to chew off nucleotides in the three prime to five prime direction, provided that a mistake has been made. But as we will see, some polymerases also have, oddly enough, a 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease activity. And you think, well, that's very strange, in that if you are polymerizing by adding nucleotides in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, if you're adding nucleotides in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, why would you want to remove nucleotides in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. That's what this activity is. It's a depolymerization activity. That's what exonuclease activity is. Um, why would you want to do that? And we will see a reason why shortly. Um, and I'll leave that for now. I'll leave that uh, out. I'll leave that hanging and we'll address that in a minute. So we'll want to look at these activities of DNA polymerases at the replication fork. Now, we, Kornberg, having discovered these, uh, these uh, properties of DNA polymerases that he isolated from bacteria, um, realized, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to be obvious, that this 5' prime to 3' prime, this exclusive 5' prime to 3' prime polymerase activity is going to present a problem for DNA replication. And the, I want to consider that right now, so let's talk about that. So let's imagine that we have a double helix of DNA that's being replicated and we have a replication fork. So let's say we have a replication fork here and this is double helical DNA and then the double helix has been separated into single strands here. And let's say that this is a five prime to three prime polarity over here and then 5 prime would be here and 3 prime would be here. And of course these go, we're only looking at a short stretch of a chromosome, tiny stretch of a chromosome. So these strands go off and continue on. And now we are synthesizing new DNA upon um, the, the, this old DNA. Well remember, we can only synthesize DNA in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, that, given the activities of DNA polymerase. So if we look at this strand over here, we see that, okay, if we're synthesizing DNA 5 prime to 3 prime, then we're reading a template in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So we would proceed, be proceeding with DNA replication here, synthesizing 5 prime to 3 prime. Everything is fine on this strand. But over here on this strand, we have a problem. We can't be synthesizing uh, 5 prime to 3 prime here because that would not be an anti-parallel strand. So instead we've got to initiate replication from the point at which single-stranded DNA starts. So we must synthesize DNA like this, 5 prime to 3 prime. Well okay, that's, that's alright, but look, let's look what happens now when we look at a little further um, down the line here. So now we've opened up more of the double helix. We've separated 
separated out more. And so we will have continued to synthesize new DNA over here. Everything's continuous and everything's fine in the five prime to three prime direction. Here we have three prime to five prime. Here we have three prime and five prime. And here what we have is this molecule right here is will exist now here. So that's what we have synthesized previously. That's this molecule. So we have to now start anew in order to synthesize 5 prime to 3 prime. We've now got to synthesize a new DNA molecule. As the helix, as the double helix has opened up to allow for further replication, on this strand everything has been continuous. But on this strand, synthesis has to be discontinuous. 5 prime to 3 prime. And notice that we it's discontinuous because we synthesize a short stretch and then we have to synthesize another short stretch. And there is a gap between those, those um, newly synthesized daughter strands of DNA. So on this strand, we have continuous replication. And we call this the leading strand. That is where DNA synthesis is continuous. And this strand we refer to as the lagging strand because what we have on this strand is discontinuous DNA synthesis. So DNA synthesis, if we look at DNA synthesis, we already know that it is semi-conservative. Semi In fact, what we've been drawing is semi-conservative replication on both strands. But DNA synthesis is also semi-discontinuous. It's discontinuous on one strand and continuous on the other strand. Furthermore, when we consider DNA synthesis, we have to remember that, uh, that the polymerase is characterized by Kornberg, and we now all know all DNA polymerases essentially require a primed template. So let's look at that a little bit now. Let's look at a uh, Another replication fork here. <clears throat> well, on the on the la on the leading strand, at some point there had to be the synthesis of an of a primer, and then new DNA was built off the end of that primer. And it turns out that for DNA polymerases polymerases to work, there needs there actually is synthesized an RNA primer at the beginning of DNA synthesis. And on the leading strand, that RNA primer will have been started at an origin of replication. That would have been inserted by, at an origin of replication by an enzyme that is, we will call primase. It is an enzyme that synthesizes a short stretch of complementary RNA that is complementary to the DNA at the origin of replication. And that RNA primase synthesizes that, and then DNA polymerase comes in and is capable of, then polymerase comes in, polymerase comes in and synthesizes a new strand of DNA. This is on the leading strand. Well, on the lagging strand, every time a little bit of DNA has been, is opened up, we need to have a primer here that is needed to be synthesized, and then new synthesis of DNA occurs in the five prime to three prime direction. And then every time the replication fork opens up more, we must synthesize a new primer and then build on that with the DNA polymerase. So there is a need for constant primase activity on the lagging strand. This is lagging, and this is leading. So on the lagging strand, we must constantly synthesize new primers that can then be built upon by DNA polymerase. So we've got to have DNA polymerase acting here as well. Polymerase is here. And then we must remove the RNA primers from DNA, otherwise our DNA would contain RNA in them. So we must remove uh, the primers, primer removal, and we're going to talk about that in just a second here. And also, at the, when those are removed, I'll just remove those here, 
When those are removed, we must find a way to seal the, the nicks in the strand of DNA that exists between the fragments produced by DNA polymerase on the lagging strand. So we're going to require a ligase or a joining activity, an enzyme that can join the fragments of DNA that are produced on the lagging strand, as we will see. So let's examine the replication fork now, having identified some various activities that are required, and we'll identify more shortly. Um, but ha So let's look at this now in a little more detail. <clears throat> so here is our, here's our, uh, let's say this is our, our parental DNA double helix. And we open up the double helix and create a replication fork. Well, on the, um, on the leading strand, synthesis occurs continuously from an RNA primer. And on the lagging strand, synthesis 5' prime to 3' prime occurs initially by priming a segment of DNA right at the heart of the, of the fork and synthesizing new DNA out. And then as we open up the double helix more, we see that we are producing these fragments. And these fragments of DNA that are uh, that on the lagging strand that are produced are called Okazaki fragments after Okazaki, who was a postdoctoral researcher in the Kornberg laboratory that, that I've mentioned. So here you can see we have continuous leading strand synthesis and here we have discontinuous lagging strand synthesis. And there's going to be a need to remove these RNA primers um, prior to ligase sealing the Okazaki fragments, sealing the sugar phosphate backbone. So now let's look at this a little, a little more detail enzymatically speaking. So here is the um, synthesis of DNA that occurs on the, la on the leading strand is um, that synthesis is made by a, an E. coli in bacteria by a polymerase called DNA polymerase 3. Likewise, DNA polymerase 3 is responsible for elongating from an RNA primer, elongating DNA stretches for an Okazaki fragment, for an initial Okazaki fragment. But then there is a second DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase 1, that comes in and binds to the gap between Okazaki fragments and removes the RNA primer. And you'll remember I talked about DNA polymerases having an, an enzymatic activity. We had three enzymatic activities, if you'll recall. We had five prime to three prime polymerase activity. That's what we've been examining over the past few minutes. This would be five, sorry, this would be five prime to three prime polymerase activity here. Um, and on the, on the leading strand, again, here we would have 5 prime to 3 prime um, polymerase activity. But polymerases also have proofreading activity, which is 3 prime to 5 prime nuclease activity, the removal of nucleotides in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction, chopping them off if mistakes were made, moving in this direction. But also, there is a 5 prime to 3 prime nuclease activity. And I said, well, that's kind of paradoxical in that if you're polymerizing DNA in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, if you're going, synthesizing DNA 5 prime to 3 prime, why would you want to remove nucleotides going 5 prime to 3 prime? That seems like an odd enzymatic activity. And that enzymatic activity is to remove RNA nucleotides from Okazaki fragments moving in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. And as those are removed, the 5 prime to 3 prime polymerase activity comes in and inserts new DNA uh, precursors, that is deoxy uh, nucleotides, into a DNA molecule. And then, after that is done, what we have is a continuous DNA molecule except for a gap that still exists between the what would have been Okazaki fragments and the enzyme DNA ligase seals that nick in the, um, in, the, uh, in the sugar phosphate backbone of Okazaki fragments. It joins together um, the phosphorus and oxygens in the, in the sugar phosphate backbone to create an intact double helix. So we see there are, uh, the, the enzymatic activities at a replication fork are rather complex and this is greatly simplified.
Let's remember the activity of our primase enzyme, our RNA primase enzyme that builds an RNA primer at the origin of replication for the leading strand and continuously on the lagging strand, new primers have to be built every time a little bit more of the parental double helix is unwound. So the lagging, stand require, the lagging strand rather requires um, continuous or regular, I should say, it requires regular primase activity. Whereas for the leading strand, we only really needed primase activity at the origin of replication. And from then on, DNA synthesis is continuous. Well, things get even more complicated, so let's look at some more of the complex machinery, molecular machinery that is required at the replication fork. And well, uh, here's an enzyme that we haven't mentioned before called helicase. A helicase here is needed to unwind the parental double helix into single strands, which can serve as templates for new strand synthesis. And as you might imagine, since there are hydrogen bonds linking the two strands of a double helix together, to break those hydrogen bonds requires energy, and helicase requires um, the energy of ATP to uh, do its work. It hydrolyzes ATP in order to unwind the double helix. So considerable investment of energy re is required to, to uh, separate the parental strands into um, single strands that can be used as templates. But if you can imagine, let's imagine two, um, a, a rope down here. Let's, let's just look in, and imagine a rope that is made out of two intertwined fibers. And let's do, let's say a red fiber and a black fiber here that are intertwined. And if you started to unwind these, separate them, kind of twist them like this, you can imagine that that would create considerable torque on the, um, the remainder of the rope. And if this were somewhat fixed at one end, this would re this would generate super coils. The, the rope would get all tangled up as you un, tried to unwind the fibers, if you unwound those. And so there are enzymes that relax the super, that happens to DNA, actually. Um, that happens to DNA. And there, it's, there are enzymes required to relax the super coils that are induced by the unwinding activity of the helicase. And those enzymes are called the DNA gyrases, or also these are known as topoisomerases. Topoisomerase. So these two enzymatic activities, helicase and then gyrase, are required to uh, make first single strands that can act as templates, and two, to relax the supercoiling that is induced by um, the unwinding activity of helicase. We've already talked about the requirement of primase to synthesize new primers, um, especially for the lagging strand, and initially on the leading strand at the origin of replication. And um, we've talked about the need for DNA ligase to seal on the lagging strand to seal Okazaki fragments together. And we've talked about the two polymerases at the, at the E. coli replication fork. First DNA polymerase 3 that is active on the leading strand and is also active on the lagging strand, building new DNA from the RNA primers that have been being built here. So DNA polymerase three is required for that. And then we talked about the need for DNA polymerase one to bind to the gaps between Okazaki fragments, remove RNA primers, and to synthesize DNA in its place. And then DNA ligase can do its job of sealing the, the NICs in the newly synthesized uh, lagging strand primer. So to get our, our, um, our terminology right, I want to refer to the template strands as template. So the template strand here would be this one. And then the newly synthesized strand we're going to refer to as the primer strand because that was the one that was primed and that's the one we're adding new bases to. So this would be the primer strand. And something that we haven't talked about yet, if you'll remember, is that we that DNA polymerase activity is processive. 
meaning the polymerase can remain associated with the template and primer for long periods of nucleotide addition without falling off. That's what we mean by process, processive. And E. coli, that processivity is provided by a sliding clamp. It's called the beta clamp. It's the beta subunit of DNA polymerase 3. And that subunit is a donut-shaped molecule that clamps the machinery, the other polymerase machinery, to the template and allows for, for the machinery to slide rapidly along DNA as DNA synthesis proceeds, but prevents the machinery from falling off because it is clamped on DNA, as we will see. I'll show you in, in just a moment. In addition to all the proteins that we've mentioned so far, there are also single-stranded binding proteins that are required to prevent the reannealing of the parental strands, because after all, they are complementary to each other and can potentially form hydrogen bonds or can reform hydrogen bonds that have been broken by helicase. So single-strand binding proteins, the SSBs, prevent reannealing of the template strands so that new DNA can be built upon them. So you can see that the enzymology of the replication fork is very complex, and we refer to the complexes of proteins at the replication fork as a replosome because it is a large macromolecular assemblage. The, the, the ribosome is a large macromolecular, macromolecular assemblage of RNA and protein that synthesizes protein. The replosome is a large macromolecular assemblage of many proteins that is a, really a complex that is responsible for synthesis of DNA. So this is the replosome. And um, you can pause the movie here and examine different parts of a different different a sequence of events that would occur at a DNA replication fork um, you, looking at this complex replosome and the activities of the proteins that are going on and you will see that the that on the lagging strand we have to loop out the um, the lagging strand template in order to allow for polymerase 3 on the leading strand to be coupled to polymerase three on the lagging strand, and for a clamp loader proteins that load the, uh, the beta clamp onto template to be able to do that um, consecutively to the leading strand and the lagging strand. And um, you can go through this process and, and see how, how this would work. I'll just freeze it right here for you. I mean, rather, you can freeze it on your own. You can freeze this movie on your own. And you can also consult your book if you want to look at these in, in a little more detail. Now I want to talk about this sliding clamp a little bit and um, show you that it is in fact a donut shaped molecule that clamps onto the template and primer strands and anchors the rest of the uh, DNA polymerase 3 to the molecule that is, be, is going to be replicated. And I'm going to want to talk a little bit about the structure function relationships of this molecule. So that's what I'm going to do right now. This is the E. coli DNA polymerase 3 beta subunit. That is the sliding clamp, the beta clamp, the sliding DNA clamp that anchors the polymerase machinery to the molecule being replicated. And what we can see immediately is that this is a dimer. This, this protein is a dimer consisting of two identical subunits joined head to tail. And um, there's a prominent hole in the middle which will clamp onto uh, DNA. And if we look at um, the head to tail arrangement of these monomers, we can see them as follows, coloring uh, the amino ends blue and the carboxy ends red and everything else in between. Um, intermediate shades, green and yellow, we see that we have an amino end of one monomer here and the carboxy end over here, and then that's so head to tail, and then here we have head to tail, uh, amino end of this monomer, carboxy end of the monomer over here. And if we look at the 
carboxy termini of the monomers, and we'll highlight those in a red space fill, you can see that they project from the molecule, from prominent loops of the molecule, here and here. And this surface of the molecule is consisting of those loops are what interacts with other parts, other subunits of the polymerase and um, allows this molecule to hold those other subunits of the polymerase down to the template as this sliding clamp moves along the DNA. And what you can see is that for each monomer here, we have a dimer, for each monomer there are um, uh, there are alpha helices which line the center, the donut hole, if you will. And those alpha helices are going to play a very important role, as we'll see, in the properties of this sliding clamp that allow it to move rapidly along DNA. So let's look at the 35 angstrom diameter hole in the middle here of this molecule and look at those helices. And if we model DNA in the middle of this, here's DNA shown, and um, what we will see is that, uh, just a moment please, stop rotating. What you will see is that these alpha helices line the cavity that clasps DNA. And that if we look at the orientation of the grooves of DNA, notice that the grooves are running, let's say in this orientation, they are running like this. They are running in, let's say, a two o'clock to um, 8 o'clock kind of orientation. Those are the grooves of DNA. But if you look at the helices, they are running in a, say, 4 o'clock to 10 o'clock direction. That is, the axes of the alpha helices that line the cavity that binds to DNA are running perpendicular to the grooves of DNA. And it is that perpendicularity that prevents the, the protein from engaging the DNA from engaging the uh, nitrogenous bases in the grooves of the DNA uh, too tightly. That perpendicularity prevents a, a tight engagement and allows this molecule, although clamped on DNA, to slide along it in a very rapid fashion, which you need if you're going to replicate DNA quickly. And so this sliding clamp has structural features that allow for its very interesting function. So that concludes the main part of our discussion of DNA replication, but uh, in the next part of this lecture we'll briefly readdress the actual chemical reaction of nucleotide addition, and then we're going to look at a special problem that arises in the replication of eukaryotic linear chromosomes that does not arise in the replication of circular bacterial chromosomes. And so that, those two features are what we're going to address in the next part of this lecture.